I'm Rob Lacuri, a senior editor here at Gold Derby with Susan Downey and Amanda Burrell, executive producers on HBO's Perry Mason and Netflix's Sweet Tooth. They're also the brains behind Team Downey. Um, okay, now, both of you, thank you for joining me today. We have plenty to talk about. I want to go straight into Perry Mason season two because I haven't finished the season yet and I'm obsessed. So straight up, season two opens on 1933. The yes. Dodson trial's over. Straight away, Perry seems adrift, okay? But we know that there's the building blocks of something much larger, larger about to take shape in this yes. season. So, and, and it's a different look. I feel like the season's moved on mm. from the look of season one. So who wants to talk me through what was the brief of season two in terms of continuing the story but bringing something fresh to it? Well, we had an opportunity with season two to evolve the world of Perry. Season one was a lot of setup. Uh, we had to get Perry to even be a lawyer by the end, by the end of this, well, midpoint really. And then by the end of the season, he had found a version of victory for his first case and really we brought together this like power trio of he and Della and Paul. Um, but obviously you didn't want to start a season where they're all great and happy. We sort of said like the super friends came together, but you know, we wanted to start them fractured at the beginning and to see, you can have all these hopes and dreams, these aspirations, you get to a place, but now when reality sets in, where do you go from there? And we really looked at it through what we wanted to do with our characters this season. We also had this incredible opportunity with these new showrunners coming on, um, with Jack and Michael, and they were massive fans of season one. However, they felt that there was an opportunity to kind of, as they said, bring in the sunshine. And that is in a lot of different areas. That's in the visual look you were just referring to. That's in the tone of leaning into the kind of wit and humor that we use to balance some of the harder hitting kind of topics that we play around with. And we got to expand the world of the have and the have nots. 1933, worst year of the depression. Um, and within that uh, sort of really diligent research that they did, they sought to tell an expansion of character for Perry, Della and Paul. So our starting point was like, what more do we wanna do with these characters? What gauntlet do we wanna put them through? And that with some, again, well-researched tidbits and pulls from, from real history, real characters things were based on, they wove this incredible mystery that let everything grow a bit more, us go to new places in Los Angeles, see deeper facets of all of our characters. Yeah. I love Matthew Reese in this role. I know. So do we. Emmy winning actor, by the way, but he is phenomenal in this. And yes. I'm curious, you know, what what is it? What does he bring to the table as number one on the call sheet on this show? I can, you know, part of also, I think, reshaping season two, two was about Matthew. And he brings naturally when you meet him such a light, like he's just, we wanted to see him smile a bit more. <laughs> we wanted to see him win. We wanted to see him have a bit of fun too. So that was really important to us this season. But as number one on the call sheet, he is just the best. He's better than you could have ever expected. He takes it really seriously. He hops in the van with props to get to set. Like he is no ego. He sets the absolute stage for everybody to be invited into the collaboration. Mm -hmm. And, and he keeps a, he's just so calm and loving. And especially I think for Juliet and for Chris, he's just such a partner to them. Um, so we couldn't be more thrilled to have him as our leader. Yeah. Yeah, and the other star of the show to me is LA. And yeah. like I love the stylistic choices. And 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 honestly, I I was one of the people that adored the look of season one. I love that neo-noir. It was very murky and it was mysterious, ambivalent. I loved that. But now you've brought in, as you say, the sunshine. Yeah. And at first I was like, oh, oh, what's happening here? I don't know if I'm impressed. But then I got straight into it because I just love the way your team was able to make LA look so authentic in that time period. That is so hard to do. I know that for a fact. Who wants to talk me through that challenge of showcasing LA, but obviously making sure that it's authentic to the time period? 
Well, look, it's it's really kudos to all the incredible craftsmen and women and people that are working on this behind the scenes and doing all the diligent research. And I think we did set in season one, there was an authenticity that was very important, even if it had a, maybe a little bit more style and, and darkness, as you say, there was this concept of under the fedora that Tim Van Patten established with us in season one. And what we meant by that is you wanted to feel the grit in the streets. You wanted to feel like the clothes were lived in. They didn't, they shouldn't look like costumes ever. Same thing with the environments. And, you know, it was so amazing what Keith Cunningham, who was our production designer did. If you went and there'd be things on someone's desk that, you know, the viewer's never going to see, but it it is you know, proper and, and it is from a time period. It is completely accurate. I think it helped the actors kind of really immerse into that. Similarly, our costumer, Catherine, she, she would have Della in undergarments from the time yep. period. So the clothing would sit correctly. So for us, we really want people to be shot through that portal in time, but also what, what we, <laughs> We did strive for it. It's interesting. Is like I said, 1933, it's the depression. Like, why would anyone want to go back and live in that time? But we wanted to create a world that absolutely people felt they wanted to go in. There was a style to it and it felt like a real place. You didn't feel like you were in sets. And the challenge is there's not a lot of Los Angeles from that time period. You're on the periphery. That exists. Exactly. You are on the periphery. You're going to sort of more remote areas. And then you have to be very skilled with how our wonderful effects team is filling in some of these gaps, some of the set extensions, those kind of things. Um, but I think locations it, are vital, though. That was like a huge thing. But Keith, the thing that's great about Keith Cunningham, our production designer, too, is this is his passion. Like, as soon, this is what he wanted to do. The idea of being able to give these incredible art department and, cat, and, and our costumes department the challenge of 1930s LA, this is like their dream. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, Kate Adair literally was like, I all I want to do is live in that world. So the fact that it led from their passion yeah. was like, like the most exciting because then it was endless. Then it was Keith going out to Santa Clarita every day, just like hitting the pavement. He had such a, his, his wall behind him we, in the interview already had like, <laughs> That's sure that right. he, he yeah. promised it wasn't staged, but it was almost like, he was <laughs> like, I'm ready. I'm waiting. I've been waiting all my life to do this. So that was what it, the thing that was most exciting was, and it was so much an extension of their already passion that they got to realize in our show. I love it when you bring a team together who are so engaged and so ready. Uh -huh. And I, I honestly believe that this show has set, set a benchmark for the look and feel of LA in the 30s. So kudos to everyone on the team. And then, of course, you've also got Sweet Tooth that just dropped on Netflix season two. That was a yeah. huge success. By the way, eight family Emmy nominations, winning two for Nonzo and Sound. Yeah. That is better than kicking the face. Uh, what did it mean <laughs> to you to get Sweet Tooth out there and then so well received and the Emmys loved it? I mean, it's like, it's, it's such a wild kind of dream because it really is, it's a bold show. I don't think there's any other dear boy shows out there. It was a bold <laughs> swing for us at every turn. Susan and I would often look at each other and go, is this going to be, <laughs> get this. Um, but the vision of Jim Mickle was so extraordinary and being able to do a second season was like just a dream. And Christian, especially after season one, seeing Christian's talent and his captivating and Nonzo, I mean, audience is just engaged so strongly that we were just, we couldn't be more thrilled that there's a season two. And, and we got to live this. Dream. Yeah, it's always nice, A, when you get a season two, B, if you get any sort of recognition or accolades, because yeah. for us, we get so inside of the productions yeah. um, that we definitely lose perspective and they do become babies to us that, you know, we think every, we're trying to be critical and trying to make sure we're keeping the true north and supporting the vision of our showrunners and our filmmakers. Um, but you don't know. You're like, I think, it, I think it's working. But if you're taking risks along the way and you're doing things that, you know, make you a little bit nervous, that's that's certainly what we strive for. But you really hope that they work. So it is nice to finally get season two of both shows yeah. out into the world and see that people have been responding favorably. And we're like, OK, so we're not crazy Ooh. this time yet. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The thing is with that I love about Sweet Tooth actually is like we've there's a lot of 
post-apocalyptic shows that have been out yeah. there that are on there now. That's great. What this show has kind of shown me is it's ambitious because it uniquely contemplates humanity in a really kind of beautiful way. I'm trying to find the best word for it, but it's really quite a beautiful show. Um, what was the intention behind that? It could have been way more brutal. It could have been scarier. But this one, is, it's, um, yeah, you tell me because you've probably got a better way of words than I do. I think it's like, I, I, it's at, at its core for us when we connected to it and when we were talking about hybrids and this kind of next generation of, of people, of kids, of, of that spirit, there's always hope. Yeah. And that yeah. like resilience and the and what we want to put out in the world is like, there is a future. We're going to have to figure it out. It ain't always going to be easy, yeah. but there is one. And we should all, and there's also going to be joy. And so a lot of that came from our collective, Jim bringing, you know, he, he always felt that. And then the spirit of the people in New Zealand who made it, were always that, like it was, everybody was passionate. Everybody saw where the magic could be and could live. And that, so it, it's like pervasive throughout the show. So I think what you feel is that undercurrent that we all felt, which is that this is, this is ultimately about hope and resilience. Yeah. And I, I think in general, when we're trying to create something and, and bringing the teams together, it, we do want to world build, whether you're creating something, as we call this one, a storybook dystopia, to the point you made. We weren't looking for that very cliche, post-apocalyptic, crumbled buildings, Not gray palette. Yeah. Like we wanted it that nature has reclaimed. And that was something that, you know, was a pivot from the source material that Jim really had the vision for, but we also had support of Jeff Lemire who created it. And he understood that mm -hmm. to have an audience leaning in and showing up every week, we wanted to have something that felt like a place you really wanted to spend time in. And um, I think that extends even when we world build with Perry Mason, like any of these places we have to play in for as many months as we do and getting people, you know, on board to come and bring it to life. You, you want to be excited about being in that space. When your producers on series like this and all the other series that you're working on, which we will touch on later, you have to foster a very close bond connection and trust with the showrunners. It's very important. If that doesn't work, the whole thing falls apart. And I've heard that time and time again. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Walk me through what you most valued creatively and personally about Jim and the, and the showrunners on Perry Mason on both shows. Well, we really see our job as we're there to make them better, give them the space to create. Mm -hmm. We're not interested in being the showrunners. We want to support them in whatever way we can. Yeah. And so it's really, I think it's about that kind of, we don't have an ego in it. We're here to be your partner and we're here to support you. And Jim season one, like he proved, he proved so quickly his leadership abilities that, and as a director, especially that it was just such a pleasure to see in season two, like, you know, he really owned the space. And so, and Perry Mason, you know, we made a pivot to different showrunners. But ultimately, you know, it really is Jack and Michael's vision and we are there to challenge and support and almost be the kind of audience, you know, for them is like, you might, they might be in the weeds a bit. This is what we're feeling when we see this. So it's really about that partnership. But the goal is like, nobody has egos. We should just be in it together. And I think once you have that unit clear, that is, is in every choice that you make. Yeah, I think we always say our job is to fight for the show. Yeah. And um, I think that also when you set out to do something, you identify your true norths. And part of our job is to keep that clarity because directors can get drawn in. They can get, you know, in all the conversations they're having, whether it's with talent or with their crew and or networks yeah, or networks or any of that. And, and it's not to say things can't evolve or some great idea can't adjust something, but you all know why you set out to do it. And so again, as part of the navigation, we're there to keep that sort of true north and keep, make sure that this massive thing that you're building is heading in that direction. And as Amanda said, so much of that is creating the space for your showrunners to do what they can do best, which is figure out the story they want to tell, the way they want to tell it and preserve that and keep like, other things at bay for them where they don't even have to worry about it yeah the the thing is you could say this about any profession in any field good leadership 
is all about that true north and it's about fostering an environment where everyone's doing their best. And yes. I don't want to sound flippant, but you're creating art. Okay, so you're not um, curing cancer, but you're still trying to give us something that we will love and enjoy and cherish and cry over and laugh at. And yes. so that brings me to this. I always ask this to producers because I'm fascinated by this, this whole uh, question about when you make something, it's a challenge and it, it, it's, it's hard work and you you want to stand out in a crowded, chaotic marketplace of content and distraction. Is it worse for a series like these two series to be met with indifference and be ignored? Or would you prefer to at least go for the, you know, go for the, uh, the fences and then maybe fail? Well, I, I mean, to us, there's, it's, there's no option. Yeah. Like you have swing to, for the fences. You, you have yeah, to swing for the fences. We're not looking for singles or doubles. Like it, it's too crowded a marketplace. You're putting too much time, effort, and energy into it. You know, the goal, especially in series, obviously is build something that's so great and undeniable that people want it to keep going. You have this great engine of people and ideas that, you know, can continue to just live on. Um, but yeah, I think anything that for, for us, if we're listening to something, we've had things come our way, um, be it source material or pitches or whatever, and we'll, we'll hear something. We'll be like, yeah, someone's going to make that show, but it's it's not for us. It has to be undeniable. We always say like, if we hear something and we start asking questions, probably not for us. If we hear something and start building on, hey, we could do this and this could be a great partner and we could do this, then we know we're, we're, we're onto something that we like. But also we're the dog with a bone. Like we, we take it on, like we want people to pay attention. We want like we, with marketing, we're noisy. <laughs> so I think it's like, honestly, part, not just our job to get the show made and, and done in the best creatives. Like that is obviously our job, but our job after the fact yeah. is to champion it at every turn and push it out there in like whatever way we can. Robert's obviously incredibly supportive. That's, yes. that helps in a big way, but also like, we're loud. Like we don't let, them, you know, we don't let them forget us. Um, and I think that's also important is like, I think that we, you got to just be pushy. Yeah. We don't really, pushy. you know, there's yeah. no other way. There's just no yeah. other way. Um, you've got so much on your slate right now at team Downey and it's really super exciting. I'll just turn it over to you. What are you most looking forward to that's coming up? Well, uh, Look, we have we have a show that's sort of near and dear to me and Robert called Downey's Dream Cars, which is coming out at the end of June on Max. And um, that's where Robert has decided to restore a bunch of his classic cars, but in more eco-friendly ways. But really, it's a conversation about the future of mobility. And it was just sort of a fun thing he wanted to do that took place over the course of a few years. I mean, his hair and weight fluctuations in that show is hilarious. I look at that group, all the things he's done because, you know, it takes time to yeah. identify what you want to do and restore the cars and then check in on them and then see the reveals. But it's got um, it's got that perfect balance that we seek in things, whether it's unscripted or scripted, that it's first and foremost, it's entertaining. Um, but it also makes you think and talk about things that maybe you hadn't before. Um, so we have that. And then we're really excited. You can talk maybe yeah. about Helltown. Yeah, well, well Sympathizer also course, is yeah. obviously mm -hmm. we're, we're going to wrap production very soon. We're going to be out early next year on HBO. Yeah. The teaser was released on streaming day, obviously, for Max. And we could not be more excited. Working with Park Chan-wook has been a deep, deep honor for us. Yeah. Um, and it's just been incredible to see it come together and the powerhouse cast we have in that. Uh, Robert's also great, but but, <laughs> but, but honestly, like, he, he's been, like been yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, he's so he's fine. awesome. He's really good. He's um, and it's like yeah yeah letters that are there already he's gonna be great <laughs> yeah he's gonna be awesome but I do think it's like we've been able to assemble this incredible Vietnamese cast and center mm -hmm. them in a really exciting thrilling story told through a really 
like amazing auteur, but also like it's going to be weird in all the ways that we kind of always look for and anticipate. So that one we're really excited about for early next year. And talk about something that's going to, it's swinging for fences. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there ain't no holding back. So it's going to be, it's going to be really fun. It's such a vision. So that one's really exciting. And then we did, we have a show at Amazon called Helltown that's yeah. based on a Casey Sherman novel that Ed Berger, who did All Quiet on the Restaurant Front, is directing for us with mm-hmm. Oscar Isaac starring. And we are, that's been a real, we got it as a book proposal and we've built it really intentionally over the years um, and are just really proud that we brought it to market with, I think we just see the vision so clearly and our showrunner Mohammed is incredible. So we're really excited about that one. Hoping that goes next year. Yep. Wow. And the senior, right? That came out not long ago. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Senior came out at the end of last year, but we're sort of pushing it back out to audiences yeah. now, obviously with Emmys Beautiful. coming up and talk about something near and dear to our heart. It's right. like, it It was one of those things that um, we went into just truly wanting to tell a story about his dad, you know, Chris Smith, who's an incredible filmmaker, wanted to say, say something about Robert. Robert's like, don't turn the camera on me, turn it on my dad. And we had no idea that all the things that transpired would, we didn't know his dad would sort of co-op the film. We didn't know. The, you knew he was entertaining though. Well, I knew, again, <laughs> I always think it's interesting. I think that what works for us in any documentary or unscripted area is the same thing that works in narrative. You have two charismatic leads yes. with differing wants and really great settings. And there's a lot of humor and there's a lot of heart. And I think that can kind of describe a lot of what we try 100%. and do in, in telling stories. Wow. I am so looking forward to these shows. Edward Berger and Park Chan Wook and some bloke named Robert Downey Jr. that I think Susan yeah. might know. <laughs> um, like, you know, I'm I'm really impressed. And look, thank you for sharing that with us today. Thank you for your time. Congratulations on both Sweet Tooth and Perry Mason. When I see the finale, I will write to your team either in yes. tears or, or laughing. And um, yeah, thanks again. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.